Hey there, this is Mr. Alexander, and over the next few videos, I'm going to solve the Unit 1 test review with you. Um, each of the videos will be about 10, 15 minutes long, so you might have to watch more than one to get through this whole review. I'm just going to start at number one. Which attribute below does not match the graph of the function? So the graph of this function, f of x equals negative 2 times absolute value of x minus 3 minus 5. Um, I just want you to imagine this graph. We know it's negative, so it's upside down. And it shifted right 3, down 5, so right 3, down 5, upside down. And because of the negative, and it's got a slope going either way of negative 2 and positive 2. So it kind of looks like this. So if I want to confirm this thing on the calculator, uh, what I can do is I can go to y equals and I can type in the equation negative 2 remember to get the absolute value you go math num and it's 1 it's abs and inside the parentheses we'll type in the x minus 3 and we'll close the parentheses to do the minus 5 and hopefully when I hit the graph button this looks the way I thought it was gonna look and it does you can see the graph down there and it's upside down so we can use this graph to answer the questions. Uh, we're supposed to figure out which one does not match the graph. So the vertex is at 3, negative 5. That looks right to me. The graph has a line of symmetry of y equals 2. Well, y equals 2 is anything that's y equals is horizontal. So it's like this. This thing definitely has a line of symmetry at x equals 2 because it's straight up and down. So that's probably the wrong answer. But let's go ahead and check anyway. The graph has a y-intercept at 0, negative 11. I can't quite see it, but if I go to the table, second graph, remember the y-intercept is where x equals 0, and you can clearly see this is 0, negative 11. So yeah, that one's right. This graph has no x-intercepts, meaning this thing never crosses the x-axis. That's absolutely correct as well. So which one does not fit? Which one does not match the graph? That's definitely B. This thing has a uh, line of symmetry at x equals 2. Let's talk about number two on this review here. Graph the absolute value function represented by f of x equals negative x, absolute value of x plus two minus one. So this thing is going to be reflected from the parent function. It's going to have gone left to, because remember inside the bars, it's all counterintuitive. So even though it's plus two, it's gonna do the opposite of what do you think it should do. And then it's going to go down one. That's what that minus one does. So when I graph this thing, I'm going to start at zero, zero. I'm going to go left two, down one. And it's been reflected. So instead of going up one over one, up one over one, up one over one, I'm going to go down one over one, down one over one, down one over one, down one over one, in both directions. Now, we should always use the calculator to confirm that we've done it right. The calculator should never be the primary means of getting the right answer, but it's on test situations, it's a great way to make sure you've done it correctly. So if I just type in the equation, negative math num to absolute value of x plus 2, close parentheses, minus 1, and I hit the graph button, hopefully I'm going to see the same thing I just drew. Yeah, that looks right. So I can feel good about that. I can move on to number 3. Consider the graph of the function f of x equals 2x minus 4. Graph f inverse of x below on the graph and write the equation. So we've got f of x equals 2x minus 4. And to find the inverse, remember, replace that f of x with a y, 2x minus 4, and then switch the x and the y, x equals 2y minus 4. And then we need to solve this thing for y. So I'm going to add 4 to both sides. I'm going to have x plus 4 equals 2y. And then to get the y by itself, I'm going to need to divide by 2 all around here. Which is going to be y equals 1 half x plus 2. Uh, another way you might write that, if you hadn't simplified it, you might have gotten x plus 4 over 2, which is the exact same thing. 
But remember, it's not an inverse until you tell me it's an inverse, so we need to write it back into uh, function notation. I'm going to go ahead and keep it in this form because I, ha I need to graph it and it's easier for me to graph if I'm in slope intercept form which this is in. So it's going to be one half x plus two is the equation and from here I'm simply going to graph it. It doesn't say to graph both equations it just says to graph the inverse so I'm going to go ahead and graph the inverse. So that's plus two and then the slope of one half is up one over two, up one over two, up one over two, up one over two, down one over two, forever. And so I've got a line that looks like this. Um, and that's it. Graph below on the graph and write the equation. So yep, looks like we've done that. All right, let's move on to number four. It says, let f of x equal 2x plus 4, and g of x equals 1 half x plus 2. Which processes below could you use to verify that f and g are inverse functions? Okay. Well, the options, number one, are show that f of g of x equals x minus 4. Graph f and g on a coordinate grid and show that they are a reflection of each other over the x-axis. Make a table of values for x, f of x, and show that it matches the table values for f of x and g of x. And then show that g of f of x equals f of g of x. Well, first off, let's talk about i. Show that f of g of x equals x minus 4. Well, if these two things are inverses, f of g of x would just equal x. It would not equal x minus 4. Because that's the definition of inverse, is when you uh, make them into a composite function, it equals x every time. So I don't think number one's the correct answer. Graph f and g on a coordinate grid and show that they are a reflection of each other over the x-axis. Now that's close. Uh, but if they are indeed inverses, the definition of an inverse graphically is that they are reflections over the line y equals x, not over the x-axis. So 1 and 2 seem to be incorrect. Now let's look at 3 and 4 here. Make a table of values for x dash f of x and show that it matches the table of values for f of x slash g of x. Uh, Maybe we can mess around with that a little bit and think about that because that's going to be harder to explain in just words. We're going to think a little bit harder about that. Show that g of f of x equals f of g of x. Okay. Well, this one I kind of do like because if they are inverses, g of f of x is just going to equal x. And f of g of x would equal x as well. So I'm feeling good about 4. So since we know 1 and 2 are wrong and 4 must be correct, we don't even need to check 3. We know that D must be the right answer. It's the only choice that's left. Let's go on to number 5 here. How is the graph of f of x equals absolute value x minus 4 minus 1 affected if it is changed to g of x equals 2 times x minus 1 minus 7? List all the changes. Well, I count three. One, two, three. So we're going from here to here. The first thing I see that's different is that two. There was a one. You multiply that one by two. So that's what we call a vertical stretch. By a factor of two. Now, we were at left four, sorry, right four. And now we're at right one. So how do we get from right 4 to right 1? That means we must have gone left 3 units. And then finally, how did you get from minus 1 to minus 7? Well, the only way that could have happened is if we went down an additional 6. And that's how you do number five.
Okay, number six on this review, where do the domain and range of the function below use interval notation? Uh, so remember that domain and range is simply a the answer to the question how far left, how far right, how low to how high. So domain, the range. So domain answers the question how far left, how far right. Uh, every absolute value function is the same. The domain is always the same. It's from negative infinity to positive infinity. Now in interval notation, remember a rounded bracket means it doesn't touch that point, but a square bracket uh, means that it does touch that point. So I'm going to use rounded bra uh, parentheses here because it never touches negative infinity or positive infinity. It approaches but not touches. The range is the answer to the question, how low to how high? Well, you can clearly see this thing goes up forever. It's going up to infinity. So I can do the second part of this. And then how low does it go? The lowest y value it touches is negative 2. And it actually touches that point, so we'll use a nice square bracket on that. And that's how you do the domain and range. How far left, how far right, how low, how high. Always write the smallest number first. All right, number seven kind of bled onto this page here, so I'll just read it and then flip over. The graph of the absolute function f is given below. All right, here's the graph. If the graph of f, and that's this, f of x, has been transformed so that the new function g has been translated four units left and down three units, then what is the new equation? Well, I think we should probably write the equation of this one and first. So this thing has been shifted, let's see, from 0, 0, it's gone right 2 and up. I'm sorry, that's right 1, isn't it? Right 1 and up 2. It's not a reflection because it's going upwards. And it doesn't appear to be a vertical shift, or vertical stretch, or vertical compression at all, because each of these boxes is worth half. So this thing is definitely going up one over one. So the equation of f of x is just the absolute value of x minus one, because it went right one, plus two, because it went up two. So now we've got this new function, g, that's been translated four units. So we're going to take this equation. I'm going to go left four and down three. So this new equation is still going to be the absolute value of x minus one, or sorry, x minus something. Um, and then something, there's, it's not going to be reflected at all. There's no negative. The slope's going to be the same, so there's no number in the front. But if I'm already at minus one, meaning right one, and I go left four, that means I need to add four to this. So this is going to change to plus three to make that thing go left four. And you can see that if I take this point at one and I go left one, two, three, four, and then down three, one, two, three, this is my new vertex. And you can clearly see that's at plus three because I want left three from the point zero zero. Now plus two and down three, it's going to be a big minus one there. So there's a couple different ways you could have thought about this. You could have plotted the new vertex and then maybe plotted the graph itself if you wanted to. So it would look like that. Uh, or you could have just looked at the equation and then said, okay, it's left four, down three. How is that going to affect the actual equation? So a couple different ways you, you could have approached this problem. All right, that's all for now. That's the end of video one. To get the rest of the review, go to video two.